السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أهلا وسهلا بكم جميعا معاكم غيداء فلمبان جي بي اليوم حيبدأ يومنا التاسع في الإمرجنسي ميديسين سمر كورس واللي باقي لنا يومين منه بإذن الله آه نتمنى أنه إحنا نكون قدرنا نفيدكم في الأيام اللي راحت هدفنا من الكورسات دي زي ما قلنا من قبل أننا نخلي الجميع يستفيد قدر الإمكان والآن وفي بداية حديثنا وقبل أي شيء نقول اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا مما علمتنا وزد اللهم علما موضوعنا لليوم مختلف وحنستفيد منه مرة كثير لأن كثير مننا يواجه صعوبة في فهمه واللي هو الـ Points of Care Ultrasound وحيكون مع استشاري مميز أيضا الدكتور عمار إسماعيل Consultant of Emergency Medicine at King Abdulaziz Medical City National Guard Health Affairs and Assistant Professor of Emergency Medicine at King Saud bin Abdulaziz University for, for Health Sciences. And رحب بك دكتور عمار ومحاضرة ممتعة لكم جميعا. شكرا يا غيدة السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته مساء الخير للجميع شكرا للدعوة الجميلة هذه وشكرا للتنظيم وصراحة هذه من الأشياء الجميلة اللي بيسووها الزملاء في الستودنت كلب في الساسم سكشن وانا صراحه سعيد ان انا اعطي موضوع صراحه مميز ومحبب الى قلبي اللي هو البوينت اوف كير ايمرجنسي الترا ساوند طيب نبدا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نقول انه نحن الان عندنا اول سؤال هل في اي فاينانشال ديسكلوجر الى الان ما في اي فاينانشال ديسكلوجر لكن اذا بدات تجينا اي دعوات ممكن بعد كده ننشرها في المواقع الرسميه وات از ذا ديل ويز ايمرجنسي بوينت اوف كير ايمرجنسي الترا ساوند اور واتس ذا ذا بوينت اوف دوينج ذس سو ايمرجنسي ميديسن is a is a relatively new specialty when you compare it to internal medicine or general surgery um, the uh, The emergency ultrasound, the ultrasound uh, part of it actually have emerged recently. So you don't have a lot of your uh, colleague who were trained in the in the uh, 80s or 90s. Actually, they were not really exposed to emergency ultrasound. They are the the, uh, the ultrasound was not widely available. It was limited to certain groups of uh, physicians, mainly the radiologist and then the uh, be gynae and also the uh, cardiologist so in uh, late 2010s actually the ultrasound curriculum was introduced uh, through emergency medicine and uh, to actually graduate from the residency in the United States you're supposed to complete a certain period of uh, ultrasound uh, training and that will include a variety of uh, application for uh, ultrasound uh, actually you are supposed uh, to do a certain number of scan before you graduate from residency in addition of course to doing your clinical rotation so the ultrasound was part of the clinical rotation there um, the emergency medicine as we said it's a new specialty in uh, in general and it is a new specialty in uh, our beloved king- kingdom uh, so uh, ultrasound is being uh, integrated into that uh, curriculum uh, so Um, what we are focusing here uh, in emergency medicine is not a comprehensive approach to ultrasound rather than a point of care ultrasound, meaning that we are not going to be uh, doing a very detailed comprehensive examination like our colleague in radiology do, but we are trying to answer a specific important clinical question and make a clinical critical decision to help our patients that we see in the emergency departments in addition to we are uh, in addition to the diagnostic application so we're talking about the trauma scan which is called the efast and we'll, we'll be talking about basic echoes uh, triple a we might uh, uh, gallbladder renal um, uh, deep venous thrombosis um, OB application, musculoskeletal, ocular, and so forth. 
uh, in addition to uh, knowing just a, a, a bit of the procedural application of ultrasound. So putting a central line, uh, I was actually uh, between uh, two eras uh, where I did ultrasound in a blind technique, and then I had to do it uh, with ultrasound guidance and then now we are uh, moving away from even putting putting a central line to get an uh, vascular access in general for peripheral IV access and also uh, how to do thoracentesis and paracentesis, nerve block, incision and drainage and then assessment of joint uh, and then joint aspiration or arthrocentesis. Uh, it is important to mention that ultrasound is a tool uh, in your toolbox to help the patient. You always need to go back to taking good physical, good history and that good physical examination. You definitely need to do that. The point of care ultrasound is an additional tool to help you make the decision uh, one way or the other. It does not by all mean give you just an answer. Uh, and you can, you can remember the famous phrase from the radiologist when they say for clinical correlation. So what are we uh, talking about here? So what is the ultrasound machine? The ultrasound machine is a device that actually sends an ultrasound beam through the probe right here from a, a various types of, of probes uh, and then send it through the cords to this computer. The computer actually will process it and then display certain images on the screen. We have multiple uh, kinds of uh, ultrasound, but they all share the same thing. Uh, they will have a probes, they will have a processor or a computer, and then they will have a display screen. If you can get it in what they call it a laptop, uh, uh, in a laptop uh, fashion, uh, that's good. If they uh, have it in uh, hooked up to a stand that you can wheel it uh, around, that's also good. Some uh, machine has uh, so, some machines have a touch uh, screen, uh, and some machine have better resolution than the others. Uh, I don't recommend anyone over the other for now uh, because it depends on your uh, local uh, hospital uh, purchases. So uh, the bottom line is uh, all machine will, will share uh, the same ideas. You can adjust your depth, you can adjust your gain and you can get images and you can store them and so forth. Now, in the new era of uh, portability, now, uh, one of the first companies actually to introduce the portable ultrasound uh, devices that you can use to uh, uh, in the emergency department to hook it up to a smart device was uh, the, the company Philips. And it is uh, called the Philips Lomify. So simply, you can just uh, get this probe. Uh, and then hook it up to an Android device. Recently, and one of the most popular one actually is the Butterfly. The Butterfly is compatible with uh, Apple uh, products. And this one here actually cost about $3,000. Uh, $3, uh, and that includes one year of uh, subscription. So a lot of our colleagues actually have purchased this device uh, and uh, it, they seem uh, extremely happy about it. So if you are uh, working in a hospital that doesn't have an ultrasound machine, uh, that is actually uh, really outdated. Uh, that's not actually, actually accept, acceptable to work in a hospital or an emergency department where you don't have an ultrasound machine. Because uh, as we said, the application can uh, range from uh, get, getting a, a very simple stuff all the way to clinical critical decisions and then doing procedures. Um, so let's dive uh, uh, dive deep into our uh, ultrasound machine. So there is uh, uh, different, there are different types of uh, probes. Uh, 
they all do the same thing. They send ultrasound beam. The ultrasound beam is going to penetrate through the tissue and then receive back the information and then uh, send it to the processor and then uh, display it on the screen. We'll start on the right side here. This is this is called the linear probe, uh, and this is has a this has a high frequency uh, ultrasound beam. It is it doesn't have a, a deeper penetration because of, because of the high uh, frequency. So that's why it will give you a very detailed. Uh, uh, picture of a superficial structure. This one is called the curvy linear because it has a curve to it and it sends ultrasound beam into deeper structure so it is good for uh, abdominal structure and deeper structure and some people actually call this abdominal probe. And then this one is called a hockey stick. Actually, this is this is kind of similar to this one, but it has even higher frequency and it, it, it doesn't have uh, that of deeper penetration. And then we have this one that's called the phased array. And it, it has a small uh, footprint than this one. So this one actually can penetrate deeper, but it doesn't, it, it has that luxury that does not uh, cross between the ribs, for example. So this is a good probe to use for uh, the cardio uh, stuff, the echo, uh, echocardiography. This is something that you can actually use in, um, uh, in, in the abdomen, but preferably in the heart. And, and this one also uh, can be used on the heart if you don't mind a little bit of shadows here and there. Uh, the fifth one is actually called the endocavitary uh, probe, meaning that it goes into cavities. Uh, some people call this the transvaginal, uh, if it is used in the vaginal uh, 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 area for uh, for example for a pregnant uh, patient so it the ultrasound beam actually come out come off this side and it will send the ultrasound beam through an array a wide array of uh, uh, ultrasound beam so well uh, let's start with a couple of cases here so what if you have a patient who is a 40 years old obese female who presents with nausea vomiting and epigastric pain and the epigastric pain is kind of like is it epigastric is it right upper quadrant or not the differential diagnosis can be a bit uh, tricky are we talking about a patient who's presenting with biliary colic or is it cholecystitis or is it GERD or is it even acute myocardial infarction well um, uh, acute myocardial infarction or acute coronary syndrome you can get an EKG, and then it depends actually on the uh, character of the pain, whether it is exertional and then the presence or absence of risk factors. But it is concerning enough to uh, trigger um, an, uh, an imaging to see what happens, what is happening in the biliary uh, tree. Are we uh, dealing with a patient who is known to have biliary colic, and now it, it, that patient is in cholecystitis or not? Case two is a 30 years old male who is presenting with an erythematous skin rash, swelling and induration. What do you do about this patient? Is it cellulitis or is it abscess? And if it is in the extremity or if it is on the uh, upper or lower extremity, are we dealing with deep venous thrombosis or not? In this uh, case, 70 years old male who's presenting with history of hypertension and smoking, uh, 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 presenting with a left flank pain and hematuria. Uh, this actually sounds like uh, a renal colic, uh, but in a 70 years old with risk factors for abdominal aortic aneurysm, you need to be careful and you need to actually look for that abdominal aortic aneurysm. Uh, or if a patient is presenting, a female patient, 25 years old, presenting with abdominal pain or amenorrhea, or positive pregnancy test, or positive pregnancy test and vaginal bleeding. What are you dealing with? Are you, are you talking about a patient who's pregnant and now we are not sure if this is an intrauterine pregnancy or an ectopic pregnancy? Or is this an ectopic, uh, is this an ectopic preg pregnancy that has ruptured? Or is it an intrauterine pregnancy that is uh, uh, going into uh, a miscarriage or abortion? Or if the patient is uh, known to be have uh, pregnancy, and now we are not sure, is this a complete abortion or is it incomplete abortion? If it is an abortion, do we have any retained 
product of conception. And uh, if the patient is pregnant, do we have a fetal uh, movement and fetal heart activity? Uh, in, and, and then a 30 years old uh, male patient who's presenting with a unilateral uh, leg swelling, are we talking about an edema? Is this just an edema or is it a DVT? Is it bilateral? Is it unilateral? Well, we said it's unilateral in this situation just to make it a tad bit more difficult. Or if you have a 40 years old male who's presenting with a joint uh, pain and swelling. Now, what are we talking about here? Is it a septic arthritis um, or is it just simply a joint uh, effusion? Uh, how can we approach these uh, patients? Or uh, last but not least, this 65 years old uh, male who has multiple risk factors, including diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and then COPD, who's presenting with dyspnea, COVID, right? Yes, you always have to consider COVID in any patient that you see, but uh, then you want to, to know if the patient has anything else. Let's say that this patient actually is presenting with epig uh, fever, epigastric and abdominal uh, pain. The heart rate is 130, but the blood pressure is soft. So what do we do about this patient? Can we give this patient fluid? Is this patient, uh, can, this patient can tolerate? Um, uh, uh, fluid for this um, uh, febrile uh, illness with hypotension and tachycardia uh, with the high uh, shock uh, index. Uh, well, as we said before, you need to ask good questions, take good physical, take good uh, history uh, uh, of present illness, do a very good physical examination, and then maybe you can use ultrasound to decide what is the next step of treatment going to be. Uh, they joke about emergency physicians that uh, we just uh, CT scan every uh, thing. We're not going to be uh, doing any CT scan today. We will try to, so to, to solve our uh, problem by just using ultrasound ourselves and not even uh, relying on having the availability of uh, our, our great colleague in radiology. So uh, in this lecture, we will be talking about just the introduction to a point of care ultrasound, the applications, and then some diagnostic uh, uh, decision-making uh, procedures, and then ultrasound-guided uh, procedures. So one of the great application of ultrasound uh, in the emergency department is the RUSH protocol, which is a rapid ultrasound of shock and hypotension that determines the cause of shock in a patient who has unknown cause of shock. It will help you identify and then identify the cause or the, or the potential cause, and then it will help you guide the therapy. So the question is, um, the, does this patient need more fluid or does it uh, the, does this patient need more uh, starting on, on pressors or is there something else that you can uh, do, like putting a chest tube, for example? So uh, we probably know this from before, but if the patient is having a, a, in a state of shock, you need to keep their mean arterial uh, pressure above 65 millimeter of mercury. So our goal is high map, right? So if we say that the, our goal is high map, this is a good mnemonic for us to remember remember the stuff that we can use to do and determine what is the cause and how to guide the therapy. So it is high map. So the uh, H stands for the heart. We'll look at the heart. We'll look at the inferior vena cava. And then we'll look at the Morrison's pouch. And that this is just to, rem to, rem to remind you of the uh, FAST or the EFAST. And then the aorta and then the pulmonary uh, studies. So uh, maybe we know this from before, but then the Rush actually categorizes the shock into the cardiogenic, hypovolemic, distributive, and obstructive. Of course, you want to ask history, uh, do physical examination, and then maybe in uh, using ultrasound, you can actually see what is the pump is doing. So is it a pump problem, so cardiogenic or valvular problem, or is it, a, is it an obstructive uh, 
uh, pathophysiology, so we're talking about a tamponade or pneumothorax, uh, and that goes with an obstructive, or is it a massive PE? Is it uh, hemorrhagic or dehydration? Can you, can you tell if the patient is dehydrated or not? And then sepsis that actually can be either due to the, the hypovolemia, uh, the distributive uh, part, or the cardiogenic, uh, the septic, the sepsis cardiomyopathy that comes with it. So in the heart examination, you want to uh, identify the ejection fraction for the heart. So you're looking at the EF, and then you're looking at the obstructive uh, causes of shock, so massive uh, PE and then tamponade. What, how do we get that? Uh, well, we have multiple views that we can uh, do for the uh, heart. So uh, the heart is uh, pretty much shaped like this. So uh, it is located in the uh, middle of the chest, tilted towards the left side with the apex uh, pointing towards the left hip and the base pointing towards the right shoulder. So when you are uh, getting the subxiphoid view, you're going to be placing the ultrasound probe in the subxiphoid area with the marker towards that uh, side, the patient's right side. And then you will be sending the ultrasound beam from here all the way to the heart, and it will get you this image right here. So when you are looking at the uh, heart from, from down here, you will be penetrating through the liver uh, tissue and then reaching towards the heart. So the image is going to appear like this because it is upside down. So on the top of the screen, you will be seeing the liver. And then uh, what is adjacent to the liver is the right ventricle, followed uh, next to it is the left ventricle and then the two uh, corresponding atrias. So if you see an, uh, an image of a heart that looks like this, this uh, can be easily uh, identified as having a pericardial effusion right here. So in this image, you can clearly see that there is a pericardial effusion that is surrounding uh, the heart. Um, and then in this image, you actually can still see that this is a liver tissue and this is the heart, but the pericardial effusion is actually huge. And it is huge to the point that the heart is swinging back and forth. And this is what causes the patient to have the uh, alternance that we uh, know from uh, before. And at a certain point, if the right ventricle is being uh, collapsed and it's not filling, the patient is going to reach to that tamponade uh, physiology. Uh, or if you have a patient who comes in and then you are uh, trying to see if the, if the heart is even pumping or not, and this is a standstill uh, heart. So if this is the situation, it depends on what where are you in the resuscitation? Are you at the beginning of resuscitation? So you just start just compression, or are you at the end of just uh, of your resuscitation and you are about to call the time of death for this patient and you just want to confirm that you're not just uh, not feeling the pulse, but you actually don't even see cardiac activity in addition to absence of electrical activity. Um, you can look at the heart by so many other uh, ways. So there is something called the parasternal long view. It will cut the heart in uh, in this dimension. Uh, so it will give you uh, what it what a longitudinal presentation of the heart, uh, looking at the mainly the left ventricle, and then part of the uh, right ventricle, the ventricular outflow track right here, and then uh, uh, which is this one here. So this correspond to this one. And then the left ventricle, which is this one right here. And this is the inside the left ventricle. And then the left atrium, which is right here. And this is the mitral valve that you can see in this one here. And then uh, the the heart, the left ventricle, actually ejects the blood through the uh, aortic uh, root, and this is right here. So it is uh, a 2D uh, view 
true, it is a video, but when you do it from sub xiphoid view, when you do it from a longitudinal and then parasternal long and sh uh, sorry, parasternal uh, short um, and then apical, maybe you will uh, get a collective information. And then at some point, you uh, can get an idea of what's going on inside this patient's heart. So in this image, for example, if you look at the heart and then decide, is this heart pumping? Yes, it is pumping, but is it pumping enough? Is it pumping appropriate and uh, enough amount of blood? So this is a poor rejection uh, fraction just by looking at it. And this is just a visual estimation for uh, here. Uh, if you look at this uh, heart right here, this is another parasternal long view. You can actually see the right ventricle right here. And then all of this is the left ventricle. Can you say if this, uh, this heart is pumping appropriate amount of blood? It's actually barely moving. And in this situation, compared to the previous uh, clip that we saw, the heart, uh, the septum is actually bowing this way. So this is a dilated cardiomyopathy with a poor ejection fraction. In this one here, if you look again at the same structure that we saw before, you can actually see that this is the right ventricle, okay? And this is the left ventricle right here. Is this heart pumping? Yes, it is pumping. Is it pumping? Uh, is, it, is it poor? It's not poor, definitely not poor, but is it normal? Well, uh, it looks like this is a hyperdynamic heart. And how can you tell that this is a hyperdynamic heart? Well, you see, you can see that the free wall of the ventricle, the left ventricle, is actually all uh, almost touching the the septum right here. So the ejection fraction is not the normal EF is not supposed to be uh, this much. How can you tell whether this is uh, normal, poor, or uh, hyperdynamic? Well. Uh, by just keep doing more images, by, do, by, by keep practicing this kind of uh, uh, point of care uh, echo in the emergency department. Once you see a lot of normal, then when, when, you, when an abnormal uh, patient uh, shows up, actually it will stand out to you. In this situation right here, do we have a pumping heart? Yes, we do have a pumping heart. Is it poor rejection fraction? It's not a poor rejection fraction because we can actually see that the heart is uh, moving. Uh, it looks like this is probably a hyperdynamic. However, uh, the confusing part is that it is a tachycardia and that's why it gives you that perception that this is a hyperdynamic uh, heart, but it is a normal uh, ejection fraction and it is associated with tachycardia and that's why it looks like that. So we'll go over this again. So this is uh, the right ventricular outflow tract. This is the center ventricular septum and this is the LV. So the LV is actually moving appropriately. You can actually see the mitral valve stroking up here, almost uh, hitting the septum and then coming back. Uh, and then you can see the aortic outflow uh, right here. The parasternal short view, the PSS uh, view, it depends on where are you cutting the heart. If you are cutting the heart at the apex, you will be seeing this image on the left uh, upper uh, corner. If you are cutting the left, the, the heart in the middle, you will actually be seeing the patient uh, mitral valve looking like a fish mouth appearance. Uh, if you look at the uh, bottom one, uh, this is at the level of the aortic valve. Let's take it one by one. So in the bottom one, you actually can see that this is a short axis view. So in a short axis, it will, it will require a kind of a spatial uh, orientation on uh, what is what, which side is, is which. And this actually uh, uh, universally agreed on that you can uh, put the probe marker if it is in the cardiac setting towards the patient's uh, uh, right side of the screen and uh, the patient's um, left uh, right shoulder. So you can actually see that this is, all of this is the left ventricle. This is inside the left ventricle. This is the free wall, the lateral uh, free wall of the left ventricle. And this is the septum. And right here, this is the right ventricle. So the, the right ventricle is actually 
it it kind of look like it the right ventricle actually grow on the left ventricle right in in this image right here uh, if you tilt the ultrasound probe just slightly uh, towards the middle of the heart you actually can see the mitral valve opening and closing that looks like what they call it the fish mouth appearance in the parasternal short view which is uh, uh, tilted towards the base of the heart at this point, you'll, you're going to start seeing the, the three leaflets of the aortic uh, valve. What is the, the significance of seeing all of these? Well, uh, if you have a patient, for example, who had a recent uh, long travel to a certain area, uh, and then uh, the patient has risk factors for, uh, example, DVT, and now the patient is coming with chest pain and shortness of breath, hypoxia, and you want to see if there is signs of uh, right ventricular strain or not, or if there is an impending uh, arrest or uh, a, a big saddle uh, embolism that you can probably either see the embolus by, by itself or actually see the effect on the heart. In this image right here, for example, you can actually see that this is the right left ventricle and this is the right ventricle. The, it seems like the symptom that we saw bowing this direction in the previous images, actually it is being pushed towards the left ventricle. So the left ventricle is barely filling, if any, uh, blood to be pumped out. So this is called the D sign. The D sign means that the, the nice O looking okay, okay uh, presentation, the O, that you can see on the left ventricle is actually distorted and this is actually representing a D uh, sign that makes you concerned about uh, an increased pressure on the left on the right ventricle because of a saddle big embolism so a uh, few uh, applications that you can actually get uh, from doing a point of care ultrasound, which is seeing actually a vegetation. You have a patient who is, uh, uh, well, we don't have a lot of drug users in the, in the country, uh, alhamdulillah, but maybe we have uh, patients who are uh, dialysis and they get cannulated every other day. So they are at risk for infection. Or we have a patient who is uh, had multiple episodes of uh, uh, sore throat, strip uh, uh, pharyngitis, and then developed uh, rheumatic uh, fever. So uh, how can we get the fourth uh, image? Uh, we do it by something called the apical fourth chamber. We said that the apex of the heart is actually located uh, to uh, the directing towards the patient's left hip. So it is uh, pretty much under the left uh, nipple. So what do you see in a apical uh, chamber? You see something called Epical four chamber view. Why epical four chamber? Well, because you are seeing all four chambers of the heart. So the right ventricle and then the left ventricle, and then you can see the corresponding uh, uh, atria, the left and the right atria. Um, when you see these, you can actually appreciate the left ventricle is way bigger than the right ventricle, which is the normal. So if you see that the right ventricle is bigger than the left ventricle, uh, question yourself, just uh, make sure that you're not actually holding the ultrasound probe in a flipped uh, fashion. Otherwise, uh, the left ventricle is supposed to be way bigger than the right ventricle. Why is that? Well, because the left ventricle is responsible to deliver blood to the whole body, including the lungs through the bronchial arteries. The right ventricle is only pushing blood against um, the uh, against the pulmonary vascular uh, uh, system, so it doesn't need that much of pressure. The pressure here is going to be the systemic vascular uh, uh, blood pressure, the systemic uh, systolic blood pressure, which is 120, to be to, to be able to maintain a very good. Uh, blood pressure to the whole body. This one is about 20 millimeter of mercury. So the difference between the two is actually 100 points. 
Um, so, <clears throat> so there is a the epical four chamber. There is an epical five chamber uh, view. The epical five chamber view is actually uh, looking at the aortic outflow tract. So the left ventricle and the right ventricle, and then the left atria and the right atria. But then, if you tilt the probe in a certain direct direction, depends on what is your initial direction is, you actually can open up and see the aortic outflow uh, tract, and this is called five chamber epical view. Uh, as we said before, if you have a patient with multiple uh, strip uh, or if a patient was born with uh, some sort of a valvular problem, then you can see and detect mitral regurg. What is the significance of actually detecting a mitral regurg in the emergency department? Well, you need to actually mobilize the resources to uh, see whether the, this patient needs an urgent vascular intervention or not, especially if the patient is presenting in a cardiogenic uh, shock uh, due to uh, heart uh, failure. Uh, in this image right here, you can actually see that the right ventricle is actually bigger than the left ventricle, or in a certain uh, frames, you can, you can see that the right ventricle is as big as the left ventricle, and that's not good. However, you can actually see that the left the interventricular symptom is actually occasionally being pushed and bowing towards the left ventricle. And this is abnormal. And that means th that there is something obstructing the right ventricle from pushing blood forward towards the lung. And that is uh, consistent with increased pulmonary pressure, pulmonary hypertension. And in our world as emergency physicians, the most common uh, cause for increased hyper uh, uh, pulmonary hypertension in our world uh, in acutely is uh, pulmonary embolism. Um, moving on uh, to pericardial effusion, as we saw maybe in the in the first image when we saw how to look uh, at the heart in the subxiphoid uh, view, in this one here you can actually appreciate that there is a that the, 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 this is the heart and it is a parasternal long view. Then you can appreciate that there is something here there is a fluid in this area and then there is fluid that is tracking behind the left ventricle here so you can actually make decisions based on this uh, are you talking about a patient who's presenting with uh, a pericarditis and then it, there is a pleural effusion what is the size of pleural effusion is it small effusion is it a medium effusion is it a moderate uh, effusion or maybe it is a very large uh, effusion to the point that it might actually cause tamponade and remember it's not about just the size sure the size eventually will cause tamponade but if the rate of accumulation is faster uh, or fast enough it will cause uh, tamponade um, and you will you will at certain point see that that heart swinging back and forth to the right and to the left and that will give you the electrical alternance uh, appearance. So uh, as we said before, the ejection fraction, it is just probably a visual estimation, uh, the change from a systole to diastole, uh, and it is something that you can uh, train your eye to do. Uh, moving on to the second letter in our high map mnemonic, which is the IVC, so the inferior vena cava exam, and that actually can tell you or give you hints about the, the patient's uh, volume uh, status. So how can you uh, use that to determine the size or the, the status of the volume of the patient? So it, 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 ha it has changes with the respiratory dynamics, and it is a surrogate to, uh, to, uh, to uh, estimate the central venous pressure, the CVP, uh, and it, it it's joined, uh, it, it is actually uh, dumping the blood in the right uh, atrium. So what do you do it with? Well, uh, with inspiration, the IVC will collapse due to the negative pressure in a spontaneously uh, breathing patient. So what you can see here, this is a longitudinal, the ultrasound probe is actually placed in the patient's epigastric area. Okay, the patient's head is this way, the patient's feet is this way. So what you do is, what you end up uh, with is that this is the liver, and then this is the rest of the abdomen, and then this is the heart. This is the beginning of the chest right here. You can, and you can actually see that the uh, IVC is connected to the right atrium right here. And you can actually see that there is some variation 
with the patient breathing. In this uh, image right here, it's like it's moving. So usually you measure it either at two centimeter from the right atrium or uh, just uh, uh, close to the uh, rene, uh, the hepatic uh, vein. So it doesn't, unfortunately, it doesn't give you a very accurate answer. Uh, if it is, uh, uh, if there is a very uh, uh, wide uh, range of changes, that means that this is probably a normal uh, CVP. If the heart, if the IVC is larger than two centimeter, that means the CVP is high. So the intermediate uh, results are going to be inconclusive. So. Uh, if it is normal, if it is between two and then 0.5 centimeter, that means probably, probably the patient is normal. If it is too, um, if it's too big, if it's more than two centimeter, 2.5 centimeter, that means the patient it is, is either volume overloaded or there is something that is blocking the, the, the blood from going from the IVC back to the heart. And that what is causing the uh, distended big uh, IVC, but if the if if it is uh, on the dry side, hypovolemic, the IVC will be really collapsing. So there there are certain measurements that you can do. However, visual estimation is also appropriate. In this image, for example, you can actually see a patient who's dehydrated, uh, and then this is the and uh, this is in uh, uh, an expiration, and then this is an inspiration. You can actually see that the difference between the inspiratory and expiratory path. Uh, uh, stages is more than 65% if you actually apply the appropriate math. And 65% changes, that means that the patient is actually having a lot of uh, a, a vo a, a volume uh, down and may benefit from uh, fluid uh, administration. So uh, some uh, pitfalls uh, about doing the, uh, the, the, the cable index is uh, if you ask the patient to take a, a deep breath, uh, what we call it sniff test. So if you have a patient who is breathing normally, you actually can see that there is no much difference between this and this. Uh, and then when you ask the patient actually to take a sharp uh, inspiration, the changes in the in the number goes from 27, which is normal, to more than 50%, which is abnormal. And then falsely, you would think that this patient needs more fluid, but that's not true. Anyway, uh, the, the initial uh, uh, idea behind getting the IVC uh, collapsibility or distensibility actually came in a mechanically ventilated uh, patient. And the physiology here is actually different because the patient is on a positive pressure. So it doesn't, it doesn't go down from, uh, it doesn't go down from an, insp uh, an expiration to inspiration. Actually, it goes up because of the positive pressure ventilation. So uh, I think that uh, that was a bit uh, too much. Don't worry about it if you cannot uh, get it from uh, just sitting through this lecture at uh, 15 minutes that we spent on the cardiac. Don't worry about it. By practice, you actually can get a hold of it and uh, eventually you will uh, train your eyes to get a visual estimation. Uh, but let's get into the M part, which is the Morrison's uh, pouch, and that uh, is the uh, fast examination. The focus assessment uh, with sonography for trauma, the, the famous uh, fast that we, uh, and uh, so the recently trained uh, physician, recently graduate, graduate uh, from emergency medicine programs, or even uh, physicians who were trained in the, even the 80s. We all actually know how to make a decision about detecting free fluid in the pericardium and in the peritoneum, which is presumably blood, because if you're dealing with a trauma patient, you are assuming that there is some sort of hemorrhagic uh, shock if the patient is hypotensive. Uh, of course, you can use FAST in a non-trauma situation, uh, looking for uh, rupture, uh, uh, rupture ectopic, for example, or rupture cyst, or certain uh, pathologies, uh, but let's focus on the fast for trauma for now. So they changed it from 
fast to e fast which is called which is the extended or enhanced fast and that because they uh, wanted to include uh, the lungs why the lungs well because you want to see if there is free fluid in the lungs uh, namely hemothorax or if there is a pneumothorax that needs an intervention and if you uh, don't uh, uh, pay attention to it the patient will the, the stable patient actually will transform into an unstable uh, patient so what do you do well you are looking for the most dependent area or most dependent or the de dependent areas of the of the body which is well probably the pelvis is the most dependent area but it probably is not the most sensitive area to detect free fluid so the right paracolic gutter and then the left paracolic gutter which is the least dependent so the right upper quadrant uh, in this image for example you actually can see that this is uh, the probe is actually placed on the patient's right flank. The head is this way, the feet is this way. This is uh, the diaphragm, and above it, it's supposed to be the lungs. This structure right here is the liver, and just underneath the liver is the right kidney. So what are you looking for in this image? You are trying to see free fluid between the liver and the right kidney. And this is actually called the Morrison's pouch. So you're gonna be looking for, for free fluid in the Morrison's pouch and the lower pole of the kidney uh, to see if there is any free fluid in case there is, and the patient is hypotensive, uh, the decision is to go to OR for an X lab. Uh, so this is an example of a patient who has free fluid in the right upper quadrant. This is the liver right here, and this is the beginning of the kidney. And you can clearly see that there is a black stripe of uh, fluid right here. And it, if you actually fan through it, you actually can see that this is a free fluid uh, right in this area in the Morrison's pouch. And then that extends down to the uh, lower pole of the kidney. You need to uh, uh, remember that the patient is supposed to be in a flat position because you don't want that fluid to actually track down to the pelvis area and you miss it if the patient in a semi-setting position or a reverse Trendelenburg position. The left upper quadrant, well, the same idea. So you can actually see that uh, the probe is actually placed on the left flank uh, region. You can see that this is the diaphragm, the, and this is the liver, and this is the left kidney. You can see the spleno-renal junction, and you're looking for free fluid in this area. Well, it's not just this area. You're looking at this area and then the lower pole of the kidney, and also you're trying to look underneath the diaphragm because the most common area that the blood will track in the left upper quadrant is actually in the subcapsular region, right? Maybe the patient fractured, uh, got punched or sustained the blunt trauma to the ribs here and it punctured through the spleen and the blood is gonna accumulate here instead of here. So you'll be looking for the blood underneath the side of the diaphragm. You'll be looking for blood and between the liver, uh, the, the spleen and the left kidney. And also you'll be looking for the fluid in, in this area, which is not greatly visualized here. So you need to move the, your probe towards this direction. So uh, this is an, an example of a free fluid in a patient with a lift in the left upper quadrant. Uh, the spleen is right here and, uh, and the free fluid is actually going around this area. Uh, Moving on with the uh, uh, third area that we look at in a patient with uh, trauma, uh, which is the, in the pelvis uh, region. So in the pelvis region, you actually are looking, uh, putting the ultrasound probe uh, in the uh, suprapupic region of the patient, head this way, feet this way. This is the bladder of the patient. This is the antiverted uh, uterus uh, because this is a, 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 an image that was taken from a female uh, patient. You can actually uh, look for free fluid in uh, between here. So when you push, you actually bring the, the tissue down. All of this is just bowel uh, uh, stuff that is moving the bowel, but there is no free fluid defining the outline or outlining the uterus and the urinary bladder. So in this image, for example, 
this is the urinary bladder this is the uh, antiverted uh, uterus and this is the free fluid that we talked about that was not present in the previous uh, clip uh, so if you see this, you actually can appreciate that it looks like the patient is probably going to have two bladders, but this is not another bladder. This is actually a free fluid that is outlining the bladder and outlining the uterus right here and even outlining the bowel down here. So the, uh, uh, the, the same concept actually applies uh, in uh, male. Uh, you want to actually get the images in a longitudinal and a tra transverse uh, view because you want to catch all uh, dimension. So this is another uh, example of a pelvic view with the free fluid, but this, uh, this time it's actually shown in a male patient. Um, well, before we move to the lungs, uh, you need to remember that the heart is part of the EFAS, but we already covered the heart. So you're looking at uh, fluid in the uh, pericardium and you're looking at fluid in the uh, peritoneum, right? So when, when we said that the heart actually has changed, uh, sorry, the fast actually has changed from fast to e-fast, we include, start to include the lungs. What do we look for in the lungs? We actually look for lung sliding. If there is lung sliding back and forth, back and forth, um, that means that the lung is actually interfacing with the chest wall all the way. And this is called lung sliding. If there is lung sliding, that means there is no air in between the chest wall and the lung, and that's what we call it pneumothorax. How do you get this image? Well, you place the ultrasound on in a transverse, uh, sorry, in a longitudinal uh, orientation. You, when you do that, you will be, you will end up seeing these uh, two ribs, and then you will be uh, seeing these two interspaces. Uh, and it depends on your location, whether you move up or you move down you will see that the lung is sliding against the chest wall and this is a good sign and that means the patient does not have pneumothorax in this area okay because the patient might have pneumothorax in this area how do you increase your sensitivity to detect pneumothorax or actually roll out pneumothorax actually by increasing the areas where you're supposed to uh, look for well if the patient is in a supine position by convention, the, the, the air, if there is any air uh, coming from a pneumothorax, is going to accumulate in the top part of the chest if the patient is lying supine. Uh, so, uh, as we said, uh, you put the ultrasound beam and then you see that this is the chest wall right here. These are two ribs. The uh, ribs in, in adults are going to be uh, bony, so it's not going to be transmitting the sound behind it because it doesn't it doesn't let any ultrasound beam to pass through. Uh, but this one here is the interface between the lung pleura and then the chest wall. Another example of lung sliding with just changing the uh, position and changing the depth. Uh, you can also use something called the M mode, which is uh, a function that you can uh, place a cursor across the chest, uh, the, the interspace, and then start grafting out what's going on. So in this one here, so this is being grafted out here over time. Uh, the chest wall is this one here, and it is grafted as continuous line all the way down here. Why is that? Well, because the chest wall is not moving, right? The, what is moving is actually the lung. When the lung moves back and forth, back and forth, it doesn't give you that longitudinal or continuous line. It will give you some sort of a dotty line. So this is called the uh, Sandy Beach uh, sign, and it is uh, a good uh, sign, meaning that there is no pneumothorax because the lung is sliding back and forth. Contrast that to this one here, uh, a, a pneumothorax. Uh, you can see still the, the continuous lines of the chest wall, but then you, you don't see that sandy beach appearance, right? It's not really a continuous line as regular as this one, but it is pretty continuous. Why? Because you don't have lung that is sliding back and forth, and it is, give, it is giving you almost a continuous line. So this is called the barcode sign. 
that means that in this area you are not seeing any lung sliding and you're not even seeing the interface uh, between the pleura and the chest wall. Uh, so the other application of ultrasound in, in, uh, in the lungs is actually looking at the pleural effusion. When you look at the pleural effusion, the, when you look at the heart in this area, as we said before, you actually can see the subcapsular uh, collection of fluid and then you also see fluid if there is any pleural effusion. So if you see that in a hypotensive patient, you would immediately realize that this patient does not have, uh, uh, does have a hemothorax. So you might actually need to uh, do an intervention. Well, uh, putting a chest tube or a pigtail or depends on the situation and what resources you have. So in this uh, uh, clip, you actually can see that this patient is breathing and then you can appreciate, really appreciate that there is black fluid. The patient is the head is this way, patient feet is this way. This is the uh, diaphragm. This is the, uh, the liver. And then you can actually see a black uh, uh, black appearance of the uh, fluid down here. So uh, can you use it in, in pediatric? Sure, uh, you can. Uh, the, the majority of the literature was actually done in, in adults. The old literature uh, uh, quoted 30 to 100% sensitivity. But the problem uh, is that we do you cannot rely on a 100 uh, on a on a thirty percent sensitivity, uh, but you can you can rely on its specificity. If so, if you see it, it is actually concerning, especially if you see it in a in a uh, blunt uh, abdominal uh, trauma patient. Uh, so the the sensitivity, as we said, is not sensitive enough, but it is uh, very uh, specific if you see it. So don't say that it's not really sensitive in, in kids and uh, just don't use it at all. Um, as we said before, uh, ruptured ectopic pregnancy can be one of the indication to do what we uh, just talked about, which is the uh, free fluid. Um, or the fast, ex excluding the, the heart in this situation. Um, so moving on to the uh, aorta. So if you have a patient who is hypotensive and you want to make sure that the patient does not have AAA, or if you have a patient who's presenting with uh, flank pain or back pain and the patient has uh, uh, multiple risk factors for aneurysm, maybe it is something that uh, you need to consider, which is abdominal aortic aneurysm, if the diameter is more than three centimeters. How do you do that? Well, you're supposed to measure from the outer wall to the outer wall. How do we do that? Well, uh, the aorta is actually located in the center uh, run across the, the, the body and it is uh, it transformed into the uh, abdominal aorta uh, once it passes the diaphragm and then it runs on the left side of the uh, IVC that we saw uh, previously. If there is uh, an aneurysm and the patient is bleed uh, is bleeding, uh, if the bleeding is, uh, if the rupture is big, actually the patient is going to have an imminent uh, death and maybe there is nothing that you can do about it. However, it is good if you catch it early on before it ruptures. So how do you do that? Well, uh, you use the uh, curvilinear uh, probe and you place it in the sub uh, view in a transverse position and then in the, in the longitudinal uh, position. So what do you get when you do that? Well, you will get this image. The image initially now uh, will look a bit distorted, but if you focus here, you actually can see that uh, this is the liver, right? But we are sending the ultrasound beam across the patient's abdomen, right? You actually are sending the, instead of sending the ultrasound beam this direction, you are sending the ultrasound beam this direction. So you will end up seeing the liver, and then after the liver, you will see down here the spine. So in just anterior to the spine, you will have two big structures, the aorta and the IVC. How do I know that this is the aorta and this is the IVC? Well, if I'm holding the ultrasound uh, in my hand, uh, the patient uh, right side, 
side is supposed to be matching the, the, the marker, which is on the left side of the screen, but the right side of the patient. So I know from my uh, knowledge in anatomy that the IVC is actually going to this direction and the aorta is actually on this direction. So uh, you can actually also look at the aorta in an anterior, in the longitudinal uh, view, you can actually see that this is the aorta and it gives off uh, branches. How, what is the, the significance of looking at uh, aorta? Well, to diagnose uh, AAA, look at this image, for example. You can actually see that this is the uh, spine shadow uh, down here. And this is the lumen of the aorta. However, all of this is the aorta. So it actually, that's why you need to measure it from the outer to outer. And in this image is actually, this is a, a, a big triple uh, A as big as uh, the spine shadow behind it. In this image, again, you can actually see that this is the spine shadow uh, down here. And you have the uh, aorta with two uh, uh, lumen. And then you can actually see that the aneurysm is huge in this uh, patient. Um, so you want to, to measure it from anterior to posterior and then get the maximum diameter and so forth. So in this uh, image, for example, you can see here that this is the IVC and then this is the uh, aorta. Uh, and then you do your uh, measurements and uh, make decisions based on what you see. Um, you need to remember that uh, rupture triple A uh, typically can occur in the retroperitoneal uh, space, so it will be difficult to visualize. So if you have a concern about triple A being ruptured, or uh, if you have a patient who is having a dissection, now ultrasound is not going to help you that much, so you might need to consider advanced uh, other advanced imaging like CT or uh, so forth. Um, the, if you see an intimal uh, flap uh, indicating a dissection, that actually can save time if, God forbid, that what you see in a patient. Uh, so well, the pulmonary, we actually already touched uh, on the uh, pneumothorax part and the pleural effusion part. Uh, but um, one of the things that you can actually detect by using ultrasound is pulmonary edema, right? So we talked about the lung sliding. We talked about the uh, M mode. We talked about uh, the M mode and pneumothorax. And these are the, the, the pneumothorax versus the, the uh, normal, and you can actually see the sandy beach here versus this one, uh, the pneumothorax in an M mode. Uh, but we have not talked about the pulmonary edema. The pulmonary edema is actually uh, can be diagnosed actually by seeing something called B lines. B lines is actually uh, a laser like uh, projections that you can actually see from. Uh, the the beginning uh, of the uh, the plural line all the way that extends all the way down across the screen. So in this image right here, you can actually see one, two, and then sometimes actually a fan-like uh, projections of of. Uh, 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 B lines. And what is the significance of this B lines? That indicates presence of uh, fluid mixed with air, which is typically what we describe as pulmonary edema, or sometimes um, a beginning of atelectasis and then uh, uh, pneumonia and maybe consolidation later on that will lead to uh, what we call it hepatization or uh, a big consolidation. So, uh, we can uh, end this section by uh, saying that there is um, uh, a mnemonic that uh, can help you decide um, what is the cause of the hypotension in this patient. Uh, and, and our goal, as we remember it from before, is uh, uh, more than uh, 65 and uh, the high map mnemonic stands for heart, IVC, Morrison's pouch, aorta, and pulmonary. Um, well, let's move on to that patient who presented with the lower extremity uh, edema. Let's say that it's a lower extremity edema and pain. Let's say that it is uh, uh, swelling and redness. Uh, let's say it's, it's a swelling uh, plus um, a bluish uh, dusky discoloration of the leg. How can you tell whether this is 
edema from heart failure, or this is um, uh, cellulitis, or if there is an abscess, or if this is a DVT. So uh, one of the application of ultrasound is to look for soft tissue, uh, looking for an abscess, for example. This is an example of an abscess that you can actually see. Uh, and then this is an example of a cellulitis. This is called cobblestoning uh, appearance. You don't actually see a collection, a specific collection of abscess in here, but it is actually just some edema between in, inside, uh, in between these. And this is what they call it, the cobblestoning. Uh, or if the ultrasound is showing gas in the in the soft tissue presence of gas is actually very concerning for necrotizing fasciitis so ultrasound can be very handy here or uh, as we said the sensitivity of detection abscess versus cellulitis actually reaches uh, 97 percent uh, the specificity is in the low 80s um, well how about detection of uh, dvt so uh, there is something called the two-point uh, uh, compression ultrasound uh, that is done to diagnose DVT. So what is the two-point is all about? Well, this is the point number one, and this is point number two. You just press here and press here, and that's it. This will not take long. If you do it uh, over and over and over, at a certain point, you can do this in less than 10 seconds once you find the uh, location. So what is what if you detect uh, DVT? What uh, can it wait? Yes, well, it, uh, it, it can wait if the patient is uh, uh, stable, but if you diagnose it early on, you can uh, implement the therapy and even shorten the length of stay for your patient and move your department. So the anatomy is, as we uh, know from before, the popliteal actually makes up the femoral vein and then they joined by the saphenous and then it becomes the femoral vein and then it joins, uh, it, it goes as an external iliac and then joins the internal iliac, making the common iliac and then going back to the IVC. And if a clot actually develops here, it goes all the way and embolizes and go and cause uh, PE. So the sensitivity uh, of uh, uh, ultrasound is actually nearly 100%. The specificity is, it is about the same. So it is very helpful actually to look and do these kind of things. How do you do it? Well, you get the patient in, in, a, in a, an externally rotated uh, uh, leg uh, and then uh, visualize the the uh, venous system here, and then you visualize the popliteal uh, vessels uh, when you approach it from behind the knee of the patient. So what do you do? Well, you get the ultrasound uh, probe, and then the ultrasound probe, you visualize this uh, structure. So uh, you don't know which one is the artery, which one is the vein. Well, you should, uh, because the artery is supposed to be lateral in the, uh, in the inguinal uh, area. So when you apply pressure, uh, when you apply the pressure, the, uh, the, the less uh, uh, pressure area, it's gonna start collapsing versus the higher pressure area, which is the artery. So in this one here, you can identify them by the anatomical uh, uh, location uh, and the knowledge of uh, how good is your, uh, your anatomy is. But then at a certain point, if you apply moderate uh, pressure, you will see that you are collapsing the vein, but not collapsing the artery. If you apply a bit more pressure, you're actually gonna appre start appreciating that there is uh, a pulsating uh, a movement uh, happening right here. If you apply too much pressure all the way to the point that you're occluding the artery and the vein, then you actually know that you applied enough pressure to, uh, uh, to uh, make sure that there is no clot inside this vein. And this is what we are looking for. And then you, re you relieve the pressure and then you go back to this one here. So what do we do or how do we do it? Well, uh, you place the ultrasound probe in the patient's uh, femoral uh, region, and then you will see arteries and veins, right? So once you see that, you actually, uh, uh, here it's not compressed and here it is uh, compressed. You can actually see that the femoral uh, uh, vein right here 
uh, all this is the femoral vein. When you apply pressure, the femoral vein completely collapsed. So that means if the, if the femoral vein actually completely collapsed, that means you don't have any um, uh, clots that's actually obstructing uh, your uh, views. So, but in this situation, for example, you actually can visualize the clot itself in the common femoral uh, vein, but then if you do the compression, uh, the vein size actually have changed, but it did not collapse all the way. So if you see the clot itself, that is one uh, way to diagnose it. But if you compress it and the vein does not compress, that means probably DVT. Why I'm saying probably? Well, because maybe you are not applying a complete pressure, right? But if you are applying a complete pressure all the way to occlude the uh, femoral artery, that means uh, this should occlude by, uh, because the, the, the pressure here is way lower than the pressure in here. So this is another example of a, a blood clot or a, a deep venous thrombosis in uh, the right uh, femoral uh, vein. So why are we saying uh, right femoral vein? Well, because the, pro the probe marker is on the patient's right side and the vein is actually more medial. Uh, so when you apply pressure here, apply enough pressure, it does not collapse all the way, as you can see in this image. So this is one of the things that you can actually uh, do. Well, let's go back to that previous picture that I showed you. Uh, this is actually uh, Phlegmasia cerulea dolens. This is one of the uh, uh, a serious, uh, extensive, uh, extensive, um, uh, clot that is uh, occlusive uh, all the way to cause even an ischemic limb. So this is a, a vascular emergency that needs an intervention immediately. Um, so um, let's touch on uh, procedure and we will end with the fun part, which is doing procedure using ultrasound. So doing procedures is important. Why? Because you want to make sure that you are doing the correct procedure in the correct side, right? You don't want to, you don't want to end up doing the procedure on the wrong side. You determine that the patient has a pneumothorax on the right side or a pleural effusion on the right side. You actually want to see that pneumothorax on that side and do it in that uh, side uh, uh, instead of just, uh, well, you know what, let's mark the area. Well, you can mark the area, but it's better if you see the actual target uh, pathology that you are going after. So uh, one of the things that we, uh, one of the application that we use for uh, ultrasound is getting an IV axis. So IV axis can be central, can be peripheral, right? Um, the uh, obtaining a vascular access can be challenging if you have a patient who is a drug user or sickler or uh, obese or edematous or uh, has multiple sticks in the past or for some reason it is uh, uh, challenging. So what, uh, what you need to ask yourself the question, is it emergent to get an access? Or is it not emergent? If it's an emergent situation and you want to get a vascular access, uh, you don't you don't want to waste your time getting uh, stuck in the patient multiple times, or actually waste a lot of time to establish uh, a vascular access through a central line. Uh, go to um, an uh, intraosseous uh, device that actually you can give anything through the intraosseous. Uh, if it is an emergent uh, situation. And if, if it's an emergent situation, you should not be spending more than uh, two minutes getting an IV access. Sometimes we see this um, uh, a lot uh, when they just want to get uh, a vascular uh, access and then you end up with uh, spending 10 minutes, uh, 10 precious minutes, uh, uh, just messing around with the patient vascular uh, access and uh, eventually you don't get it and then prepare for a central line. So if it's not emergent, then 
it uh, it is uh, important that uh, you know that IV can be placed using ultrasound guidance. How do you do it with using ultrasound? Well, you need to gather your equipments. Uh, the equipment is going to be, well, four by four, the uh, catheter. The catheter has to be the pink or the green one, which is a 20 gauge uh, or bigger. So 20 gauge or 18 or uh, whatever. And then an extension tubing, um, uh, uh, sterile gel, something to clean the skin with, and then take a derm and tape to secure it in place and then uh, flush and uh, an empty cc uh, empty uh, syringe to draw blood if there is no blood uh, taken so how do you do it well basically you are gonna visualize the vein uh, using the high frequency ultrasound which is the trans uh, which is the linear uh, probe and then you uh, just centralize it put it uh, and then st stick the patient in the center because you're going to see the needle in that area. So how uh, do we decide which vein to do we go, go after? Well, the patient has the brachial uh, uh, brachial veins, cephalic veins, and the basilic uh, veins. It depends on what you are seeing. The problem with the brachial veins is that they are very close to the, to the artery. However, if you have the ultrasound machine, you can actually visualize the artery and avoid it uh, but it can be tricky at the beginning the problem with the other ones they can be a bit smaller size or maybe a bit deeper to uh, to get uh, to so it depends on the equipments that you have if you have a long uh, if you have long catheters long needles yes you can go after it if you don't have that luxury maybe you should go uh, after something uh, else so how do we do it? Well, we have the longitudinal uh, view uh, axis or the transverse or the short axis. The good thing about the longitudinal axis is that you actually can see the needle going in right before your eyes in, uh, in one uh, motion and you don't need to move the ultrasound probe. Versus this one, this short axis view, if you put the needle, uh, you actually have to move the probe uh, proximal towards the patient because if you don't do that you're only going to see the shaft of the needle and you're not going to see the tip of the needle so you need to keep moving the, 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 the needle away so how do you do that well you start with uh, exploring the area so when you explore the area you look for uh, 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 you look for the, the cystic structure that is going to represent uh, blood vessels and then you apply a little bit of pressure to make sure that you're differentiating the artery from the vein once you find it if you find it maybe you can increase your uh, depth or decrease your depth depends on where you are at uh, right now and then in, in increase and enhance your visibility and then compress to make sure that this is a, a vein not an artery number two you want to make sure that it it's not uh, it doesn't have any clot for some reason uh, so after that you uh, grab your needle and then you insert it in the middle if you go a bit towards one side or the other you can always direct it because you can see here that it is penetrating the vein wall and now it is inside you can actually see the, the needle inside here and it the needle is actually appearing and, and disappearing appearing and disappearing because the, the probe uh, up here is actually moving a uh, few one millimeter and one millimeter and then one millimeter and then one millimeter and when you do that you actually are missing the tip if you miss the tip that's good so you want to uh, do it in a in a way that uh, you are visualizing the tip of your uh, needle to make sure that you don't go uh, through and through. So if you if you see that uh, it goes it goes initially in the subcutaneous tissue and then it uh, it penetrates uh, through the vein uh, wall and then uh, once you're in you might either get the uh, uh, patient uh, you might either uh, thread the catheter or uh, uh, trace it all the way up. Um, so once you're in, you can confirm, you can even confirm the presence of your uh, catheter inside by placing uh, the ultrasound and then you can actually see the bubbles going uh, when you flush 
that uh, uh, saline that you have connected to the NGO cath. Um, so uh, few uh, few things uh, that needs to uh, mention is uh, if you have a patient who is an easy patient, easy mean uh, that you you can you can establish the IV access without using the ultrasound. Don't use the ultrasound uh, because you need a bit of a preparation. So it is a bit time consuming. However, in a difficult patient, it's probably a better option than putting an IO um, if it's not that emergent or putting a, a, an invasive central line that carries its uh, risk. Um, uh, you need to know this because the uh, recommendation right now is even uh, recommending uh, using ultrasound guidance if you are placing an arterial line, a radial arterial line, not just a femoral arterial uh, line. No, even a radial arterial line is recommended that you do it this way. Um, so as we uh, saw before, you can diagnose pleural effusion or uh, pneumo uh, or hemoperitoneum. Uh, so putting either a chest tube or uh, doing a thoracentesis is a procedure that can be uh, uh, that can actually utilize the ultrasound. So if you are doing a thoracentesis, uh, it is really good to actually visualize all of these structures to see the chest wall, to see the diaphragm, and then to see the liver, and actually uh, get into the pleural cavity uh, and visualizing the ribs uh, using this uh, high frequency ultrasound. So once you actually get here, you can actually stop and not go and penetrate the diaphragm or uh, so forth. So what happens is here, you can actually visualize your uh, needle right here. Uh, eventually you will uh, uh, get some uh, feedback from the, the as you aspirating uh, the pleural uh, fluid. Yeah, this is something that you can uh, definitely use. Uh, last but not least uh, of the procedures is doing a nerve block. If you have a patient who is in pain, for example, and you don't want to use too much uh, uh, opiates for some reason, you can actually uh, get your needle inside the, the nerve sheath. And then once you are getting into the nerve uh, sheath, you can inject the local anesthetic and it can actually uh, uh, do what we are calling it a nerve uh, block. You can achieve uh, very good analgesia if you do this, uh, but definitely you are um, you need to be to, to do a bit of uh, training and master how to do uh, peripheral vascular access before you uh, attempt so doing something like this because uh, you don't want to cause any nerve injuries. So in this image here, you can actually see that the needle is here and um, the uh, local anesthetic is being injected into the nerve sheath and it is surrounding this nerve that looks like a honeycomb appearance and trying to avoid this vascular uh, structure right here. So uh, this is uh, my uh, last uh, slide. Uh, I will end up by saying that ultrasound is an important uh, tool that we as emergency care providers, and we share this with our uh, colleague from uh, acute care medicine and even family medicine, or it depends on what specialty you are uh, doing, uh, you can actually uh, answer uh, certain questions. Ultrasounds are becoming, uh, ultrasound machine are becoming uh, uh, available uh, in, in multiple uh, hospitals uh, these days. And even if it's not available in, in, a, in a certain hospital, you can actually get the uh, ultrasound, uh, the portable uh, ultrasound devices that can that you can actually carry uh, around and even go to, for example, rural area or a hospital that does not have it. Um, with that, I uh, will end and I will take uh, questions if there is any. الله يعطيك العافية دكتور عمار كانت محاضرة من جد رائعة وكانت فيها معلومات مفيدة مرة كثير بالنسبة للأسئلة في في سؤال اللي هو how to identify the nerve طيب 
بالنسبه لل طبعا if you if you actually see that i, I probably put in uh, a lot of information uh, here just to show you how uh, good and how uh, how it is uh, uh, comprehensive and focused at the same time ultrasound can be so uh, you can you can identify the nerve by looking at the uh, uh, honeycomb appearance of the nerve one uh, two uh, or even even before one uh, i should say knowing the anatomy is uh, is going to be a, a major uh, thing but then uh, once you augment the anatomy with the appearance of honeycomb appearance you actually can get uh, get your answer I actually, um, I actually, uh, I opened the, the the questions right here. So, the the one that uh, has the nerve already been answered. Uh, can we use the portable butterfly as all type of? Uh, yes, you can. Yeah, it depends on what uh, probes you you are getting. So, if you're getting at a linear probe or trans uh, uh, or uh, at, at a curvilinear uh, probe, it depends. So uh, I would like to have a linear probe for procedures. I would like to have a an, an, uh, curvilinear for uh, my abdominal scans. Uh, and I would like to have a phased array, but the phased array is not available on the on the butterfly as far as I know. But maybe it is, uh, uh, you can use it uh, for, for heart if you have the, uh, the curvilinear. Um, the, yeah, the difficulty of the epical views, uh, it it will be uh, uh, it, it will be a bit uh, it will need more uh, practice. You want to get underneath the left nipple and aim it towards the patient's uh, right shoulder. At this uh, uh, point, if you uh, if you start at this angle, yes, you can uh, change the angle up and down, up and down, uh, right and left, but change one direction at a time so you don't actually. Uh, 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 lose your initial uh, prepare uh, uh, your initial uh, way of uh, uh, of getting the uh, appropriate access for the epical. Uh, how much the RV uh, uh, is considered dilated? Well, uh, if the RV is uh, is bigger, uh, sorry, if it's the same size as the LV, that is considered dilated. If it is bigger than the RV. Uh, the, 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 the right ventricle that is considered to be uh, big because as we said the pressure in the heart uh, in the left side of the heart is uh, the systolic blood pressure uh, and on the right side it is just the, the pulmonary uh, pressure so it's supposed to be 20 only it's not supposed to go to uh, more more than the, more than 25 otherwise that's called pulmonary hypertension so to answer the question the size is uh, in relationship to the uh, left ventricle. So if it is similar in size or bigger in size, that's called uh, dilated right ventricle. Uh, the other question is, is it dangerous to compress uh, a, a, a vein that has a DVT? Uh, uh, that's a very smart question, actually. And in my uh, residency, actually, I asked my ultrasound fellowship director, um, or uh, the, the fellowship director at that point. Well, theoretically, yes, it is. But uh, uh, the that's why if you have a patient with DVT, you don't want to go and, and have all the 20 medical students uh, practice on that patient because you don't want to do that theoretical uh, dislodgement of the DVT. Uh, however, uh, which one would you uh, do? Uh, expose the patient to radiation, ionizing uh, radiation, and exposing the patient to the contrast, if it is even available, or uh, get the ultrasound and, and compress and get a sonar answer, because eventually that uh, the, the, the thrombosis or the clot uh, is going to get dislodged at a certain point, but you need to anticoagulate that patient. But that's a good question. I think probably we have answered all uh, all the questions. If there is no more uh, questions, I think uh, uh, I would like to thank you guys for the uh, uh, arrangement. And it was a pleasure talking to you uh, tonight. الله يعطيك العافية دكتور عمار وشكرا لتواجدك معنا ولمعلوماتك القيمة وللمحاضرة المفيدة ونشكر لكم حضوركم جميعا ونتمنى أنكم تكونوا استفدتوا واستمتعتوا في يومنا التاسع وننتظركم غدا في نفس الوقت الساعة سبعة وربع 
وننتظر مشاركة آرائكم على الهاشتاج في تويتر ويعطيكم العافية جميعاً